Welcome back everybody. Thank you so much for the good timekeeping. The people joining us in cyberspace are very pleased to see that we are taking their calendars and their time seriously. We've had uh, 423 views on, on YouTube and 23 likes. Absolutely no thumbs down. Uh, we must be doing something right, and I think it's because time for me to hand over to the NTR panel and uh, let, let Michael take over before I overplay my hand. Your, your time starts now. Thank you very much, Paul, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. As Paul mentioned, I'm Mike Curry. I'm a, a director at Primario together with my partner, John Oxenham. Um, and let's just say, you know, we, we're very, very happy to be supporting this event uh, together with our friends at Accountability Now, CAS, and uh, of course, very grateful for UCT's uh, contribution to this uh, as well. Um, and we say so for, for several reasons. I mean, I think that the importance of the topic uh, speaks for itself. Um, but we're also involved in a number of initiatives, both with the OECD as well as with the International Bar Association. Uh, I serve as the African rep Regional Representative for the International Bar Association's Anti-Corruption Committee. And that formed very much uh, under the auspices of that committee, the Project Rollout Initiative, which was an initiative to facilitate and foster the 2021 OECD anti-bribery recommendations. Um, it's been uh, as rolled out, as the name suggests, uh, across several jurisdictions. Um, it commenced with an event we hosted uh, in March last year, um, of which, of course, NTRs uh, was, a, was a sort of key topic. And I'm also very happy to be sitting next to Colette uh, Ashton, uh, who co-authored a chapter together with uh, John and myself on NTRs. Uh, the chapter was uh, part of a submission, accountability now submission to the Constitutional Review and Portfolio Committee. Um, and naturally, with, you, you know, you've been inundated with reading materials, but I fully endorse that uh, being high on your priority list. Um, I think the the topic of NTRs uh, is one where, at least in my my perspective, and I think the, the panel will probably share my views, is it, not so much a topic which is that novel anymore. Um, it's not really a question about whether we need it or why we need it. Um, I think it's just essential. Uh, we are, uh, I think the empirical evidence, um, the studies, particularly those done by the OECD, speak volumes about the efficacy of having a proper NTR framework in place in order to tackle and address uh, particularly cross-border and complex economic crimes. So I think the debate that we should be having is really the how um, and how quickly and what, what should it look like? Um, what are the, the key challenges uh, that, that we need to be addressing in order to advance this, this discussion? Um, and I think with, with that in mind, you know, it's, it's great to have the panel, as I mentioned, uh, Colette, certainly an expert, uh, did a master's thesis on this topic, um, been involved with, you know, developing this policy, I understand, with the NPA. We have uh, John, my, my colleague, who will, you know, been advising clients on cross-border matters, both in the anti-corruption and, and antitrust sector for, you know, 20 odd years, and uh, will certainly bring a perspective from the private bar and business, which I think is worthy uh, of consideration. And... Uh, then Hermia, and, you know, you're at the coalface, uh, I need a very little introduction, but the, at the coalface of this, and I know a very strong proponent and advocate uh, for the use of NTRs. Um, our panel was, we were going to have uh, Ms. Glynis Breitenbach participate in this panel as well, so we have a little bit more time than, than our previous panels uh, had. Um, and I thought what I'd, what I'd do with that extra time is really th open the, 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 the floor up a far earlier in our discussion um, to really try and identify and hit home on, on the key points in the context of this discussion. I think there, you know, there's great minds in this room and, and great minds, as Paul says, in, in cyberspace following this. So you know, after the, the, the panelists have had their sort of first initial round or made their first initial rounds of remarks, please feel free to stick your hand up. We'll get the mic sent to you, ask the questions, make the comments, and you know, I've, I've heard uh, horrible remarks that this is going to be a this is a bit of a graveyard shift, and uh, we, we'll we'll try our best to, uh, to to counter that. But please, from our perspective, I think the panelists would also prefer this to be a, a very interactive session. So, yeah, you you, ha you have the liberty to um, raise your hand at, at any point. Um, with, with that in mind, uh, I think let me hand over to Colette. Uh, Colette to give us a bit of an overview. I think to to clarify some of the conceptual. Uh, challenges or, or, or notions about NTRs, and I think uh, 
give us some insights sort of from sort of an international perspective that I think you thought would be particularly helpful to sort of perhaps set the stage and set the foundation uh, for, for discussion that follows. Thank you. Is my mic working? Hi. I want to start by um, saying I'm very happy to see in the audience my colleague, um, Dr. Tabelo Tabane. Hi, Tabelo. Tabelo was part of the research team that worked on this project at the National Prosecuting Authority, along with Jeff Badlinder, and he's the academic expert on non-trial resolutions. So I'll be passing all difficult questions across to him. No, I'm only kidding. Um, this topic can be somewhat controversial, I think for good reason. Um, negotiated settlements for corruption don't resemble conventional modes of justice. And also there are um, some serious pitfalls that countries can fall into in the design of a non-trial resolution framework. And it's important to consider those because we don't want to design an anti-corruption enforcement um, process that is itself susceptible to corruption. So we'll be counting on civil society and the media to watch over the development of any South African framework that emerges. Um, most of this presentation is based on the findings of my master's thesis, which is available at that link or just on the website of the International Anti-Corruption Academy. I'm going to start briefly with some concepts, a bit of theory, illustrate it with data, and talk a little bit about different systems in different parts of the world, and finish off with a very brief case study of an anti-corruption success story in a, in a developing country. So beginning with the UN Convention Against Corruption, which was promulgated in 2002, Articles 12, 37, and 39 provide for um, something that we call public-private cooperation. We heard in the previous panel um, from Marlene Govender from the Specialized Commercial Crimes Unit how important it is to have inside information when dealing with complex corruption cases. In fact, I've heard it said by an experienced general counsel who was brought in to clean up a major multinational that he found it impossible to identify evidence of corruption without help from people who worked in the company. Um, this is borne out by the research done for the technical guide to the UN Convention, um, cited below. I think it's important to notice that this approach to corruption um, comes from experience of law enforcement authorities in dealing with organized crime. And the similarities are the syndicated nature of the crimes and how it's, there's a pact of secrecy um, between um, parties implicated in these crimes and serious incentives are necessary in order to break that pact of secrecy. Jumping forward 20 years from the, um, the, the first time public-private cooperation was brought into the international legal framework, let's look at what's happening on the ground now with negotiated settlements for corruption. Um, as I'm sure my colleague next to me will um, talk about, multi-jurisdictional corporate corruption cases these days are mostly settled around a negotiating table with law enforcement officials from various jurisdictions and company representatives, and very large penalties, um, sometimes amounting to billions of US dollars, are divided between those um, law enforcement authorities' countries. And I'm sure everyone will join with me in saying we'd love to see South Africa receive more of that money. And in order to do that, we need to have a framework that provides for our prosecutors to be to have a seat at that table. Now, what happens when there's a report of corruption in a multinational is that a, a very well-resourced um, investigative team is flown to the country where that report comes from, and they produce a comprehensive internal investigation and report. And 
they pour enormous amounts of resources into these reports and they generally never handed over to law enforcement authorities. And with the dwindling resources available to prosecuting authorities throughout the world, not just in South Africa, it seems logical to provide incentives, serious incentives for these companies to share the results of these internal investigations with law enforcement authorities and to shoulder some of the burden of policing corruption that way. I just want to say a word about what's happening in the international environment with compliance programs, anti-corruption compliance programs. Now, I was very skeptical when I first heard about these, um, but having done many interviews with council and with chief compliance officers in multinationals who sit on the board of companies and have a lot of independence, I just want to bring a different perspective to say that there is a movement towards what we call effective, good faith, anti-corruption compliance, which is genuine anti-corruption compliance programs in companies led from the top, permeating um, throughout, the, throughout the company. And I've seen these programs at work and they actually, they are effective and research shows that they do work and they certainly make a substantial improvement on, um, on what we see in South Africa today, which is an absence of proper anti-corruption compliance programs in the private sector. Okay, some legal definitions on the screen there. Non-trial resolutions, a plea bargain is a type of non-trial resolution, but what we're looking at is non-conviction based non-trial resolutions. There are many types. It is any decision by a law enforcement authority not to take a serious corruption case to trial. In, we, we know about deferred prosecution agreements. We heard about those in the Zondo report. There are many other types. The United States uses non-prosecution agreements. They use another instrument called declinations, which is similar to what the NPA would call a decision not to prosecute. There are non-trial resolution frameworks that are simply based in administrative law, um, where they lever administrative fines. And then there are negotiated settlements. And in some countries, these are a matter of public record. In other countries, they are backroom secret deals between prosecutors and companies, and they're happening all the time. And large amounts of money go from companies to government officials in this way, in countries like China, the United Arab Emirates, etc. So they're very common. And we just don't know, we don't really have data on, on the systems in all countries. This um, graph comes from the OECD study of 2019. Um, the study of non-trial resolutions has really been driven by what, what is happening on the ground in practice. So this is not something that's been led by academics and led by concepts. It's been, um, it's been a catch-up process of us studying what's been happening in various jurisdictions. And you'll see the increase in anti-corruption enforcement over the past 20 years. Um, the, the middle line, the gray line, indica indicates the use of non-trial resolutions. And here we have some data about the use of non-trial resolutions for companies on the left, legal persons, where we can see um, the right-hand column shows that non-conviction-based non-trial resolutions are used far more um, for companies than conviction-based non-trial resolutions, and there are reasons for that. And on the right-hand side, we see that non-trial resolutions for natural persons um, conviction-based are still used more frequently than non-conviction-based, although non-conviction-based non-trial resolutions for natural persons still are used. Yeah, non-trial resolutions for natural persons are used in the United States, Germany, Italy, Brazil, and Malaysia, as well as other jurisdictions in South America. And for legal persons, 
in many countries, including the ones above. And I must say, Kenya is, is leading Africa in this regard. They've had negotiated settlements for corruption for a number of years already. I'm just going to give us a moment to read some expert opinions. This is a little sketch um, of, you'll see one axis of the graph shows a, more accountability towards the top, more effectiveness towards the right. You'll see the United Kingdom system that the Zondo Commission recommended we follow is, is very, it's highly regarded because it's got judicial oversight. So we rank it highly on accountability, but not so highly on effectiveness because there haven't been that many deferred prosecution agreements in the United Kingdom. And there are questions as to why. Is the system too cumbersome? And I certainly think South Africa shouldn't just blindly follow the United Kingdom, but look at um, available models in other countries. The United States ranks low on accountability because there's no effective judicial oversight of their system. France and Brazil do have um, only administrative negotiated settlements for corruption, and they are a matter of public record. And I think that South Africa should look quite closely at those systems. France in particular has an institution that um, is not involved in anti-corruption enforcement, but rather the prevention and support and education of companies in evaluating the anti-corruption compliance programs and teaching companies about what is, what is effective. Malaysia, highly effective. That's our case study we come into in the next slide, but not the basically secret deals, not a matter of public record. The agreements are not published. And that is a problem and Malaysia is aware of it and they are in the process of promulgating legislation and policy to provide a proper framework. At the bottom, we have China and Saudi Arabia where they're it's not much data available and not much accountability. Okay, very briefly, three minutes if I may, an anti-corruption success story. Um, the One MDB scandal, One MDB was Malaysia's sovereign wealth fund. Um, they borrowed a lot of money, billions of dollars on the international capital markets to start a sovereign wealth fund, which was looted by a syndicate led by the man on the top right, Joe Lowe, and the Prime Minister, um, Razak, in the middle at the top. Um, the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission have now achieved success with the Prime Minister in jail for corruption. And on the left, we have the former chairperson of Goldman Sachs Malaysia, who is in prison in the United States for corruption. Joe Lowe, on the other hand, top right, is on the run, believed to be in China. Um, the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission is an independent anti-corruption commission, and they had um, a window of opportunity in 2018 when, due to the scandal, the ruling party, which had ruled Malaysia for 60 years since the advent of democracy, lost its first election. And in the 20 years prior to this, the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission had not been idle. They had been drafting their ideal legislation and keeping it on the shelf, and they'd been training and capacitating investigators. They have their own anti-corruption school. They had an anti-corruption um, radio channel, which where they put out um, information to anyone without the need for data or Wi-Fi. And so they were active in, in education and prevention and, and drafting. And when the window of opportunity came in 2018, they got their new legislation through parliament in the first year and they 
launch their prosecutions. And because they had highly skilled investigators, they were able to sit down at the negotiating table with Goldman Sachs, Deloitte, KPMG, and show them evidence they had um, of corruption, very convincing evidence. And that, together with pressure from the United States Department of Justice on these companies, um, facilitated enormous settlements. Malaysia, they set a an asset recovery target, and I have an asset recovery expert next to me. They set a target of 200%. They wanted to recover 200% of the stolen money. And when I did the interview um, for my research a year and a half ago, they were over 50% of the way there, which I was told was a World Bank record. So they've been incredibly successful. And in my interview with the senior prosecutor, he said the success would have been impossible without negotiated settlements. They, um, I think many civil society organizations in South Africa would be happy to hear that the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission went after the lawyers and accountants in those firms, in their personal capacity, the people who'd written the corrupt contracts. And at that level, they, they did negotiated settlements with those professionals who could not afford to get a conviction because it would be the end of their career. So they handed over the contents of their um, professional insurance funds to the government and um, handed over evidence. And that evidence made it possible to get those high level convictions and to get those big multinationals to settle and pay back the money. $4.5 billion was recovered from Goldman Sachs alone. Briefly, in conclusion, what we can learn from this, the design of the legal framework in Malaysia, some excellent failure to prevent legislation, which they copied from the United Kingdom. In the UK and Malaysia, if someone in a company commits an act of bribery, the company is automatically liable for corruption. Case closed. Unless the company is able to demonstrate that it has an effective good faith anti-corruption compliance program in place, up and running, and that this act of bribery was just an anomaly. So we need, um, we need reform to our anti-corruption legislation. Many different acts and amendments need to go through in order to create a framework for, for non-trial resolutions to work effectively in practice. Um, I think we, I need to also highlight that cooperation between law enforcement agencies in this case was excellent, and it was led by the Minister of Finance. So um, it was, a, it, there, was the, there was political will. Um, also, importantly, at the head of the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission, there was an ethical principal, an ethical director. So many factors coalesced. Um, in order to create the environment for these big negotiated settlements and the big financial paybacks. And I'm, I'm bringing this as a success story that we can learn from and hopefully start germinating some thoughts about what could work in South Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Khaled. That's great. <laughs> you touched on a number of themes which I think have emerged from our, our earlier panels as well, which is not only focusing on the, the prosecution side of, of corruption, but the sort of detection risk um, and prevention risk as well. And of course, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, um, the role of the private sector. Now, those who followed this will know that in the US, they've strengthened their corporate enforcement policy significantly in the last couple of months, um, where they've bolstered it to the extent where even firms who don't automatically qualify for a sort of a declination to prosecute could still receive a, some form of reduced sanction or reduced criminal prosecution, depending on a, a, several factors. But one of them are exactly what you highlighted, the level of, of course, cooperation with the agencies to the extent that in the US have even differentiated between full cooperation and extraordinary cooperation. They've also then looked at for the, the efficacy of their compliance programs um, as opposed to sort of a, a box ticking type compliance program and was it meaningfully enforced. And they also make provision for things like due diligences, where if you acquire, if you're the acquiring firm and you either during or, or ex post 
uh, and cover as part of your due diligence process that the, the target firm has engaged in corrupt conduct and you report that again with all the caveats of you know full disclosure, voluntary disclosure and the rest that you, that you as the acquiring firm would have some form of immunity. The, the Assistant Attorney General uh, making some remarks in, in, in George Washington um, a few weeks ago had the following to say about the role of corporate citizens. And I'm just going to read it out to you because I, th I think it's quite an important point. And I think it highlights the importance of having business and having the private sector very much part of this debate. And it will also uh, set the foundation for my follow-up question to John. But, but he says this. He says, to our corporate citizens, the message is the same. You see, our job is not just to prosecute crime, but to deter and prevent criminal conduct. Through our enforcement efforts and our policies, we are committed to incentivizing companies to detect and prevent crime in their own operations and to come forward and cooperate with us. He says, we need corporations to be our allies in the fight against crime. And I, I do emphasize this enough, and I, th I think too often the policy debate, um, the private sector and the policy debate it, it sits at the opposite side of the table. Um, and I think there's a lot to be, to be gleaned from both or from having the private sector very much part of the debate, um, particularly on the policy side of it. Now, John, with, with that in mind, a lot of your practice obviously spanned to, to competition law. Um, you were instrumental in not only developing what's known as our corporate leniency policy under our Competition Act, but there, which is in, in many respects analogous to an NTR, it incentivizes a company to come forward voluntarily, disclose its own wrongdoing, cooperate fully with the uh, enforcement agencies and in return uh, receive immunity from, from prosecution. Now, the policy was, was of, is of course there and, and, a, and a, a well recognized one, but you're at, at the heart of sort of shaping that policy and I think you give a pretty good example um, from a South African perspective about how an NTR regime can actually work, um, even if it is curtailed to sort of in this context cartel conduct, which, you know, as you've pointed out on many occasions is, is viewed as a form of corruption, but I think the principles and the incentives for companies and how it's changed the mindset of companies um, is perhaps an important uh, anecdotal lesson. Yeah, thank you, Michael, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. I know we're probably being earmarked as a graveyard shift, but hopefully we'll have some discussion which is of relevance to you all. I think the simple answer in relation to that point is that with our cooperation from business, the current framework in order to, uh, to tackle the malaise of corruption simply won't work. Now, I think there's a, a ready utilizable blueprint that exists, as Michael said, in relation to the corporate leniency policy. I think it's certainly been recognized, it's been implemented, it was a government-led initiative, and the kind of features which we're facing today effectively were those which about 20 years ago, when I was pr principally invo involved in this, um, in relation to corrupt activities and uh, subsequently cartel activities, were, were a feature in that, um, in that environment. Now, I think corruption certainly been recognized as a significant threat to not just society, but also economic development. Likewise, corrupt activities featured probably throughout in relation to all aspects of business. Cartel activity is not dissimilar to that. It was very much recognized as that about 20 years ago at the uh, outset of the Competition Acts being implemented. But the difficulty in obviously uncovering cartels was recognized. And through a number of cases which the authority sought to run, it was clear that without the necessary skill set, without some inside knowledge of the workings of cartel activity, it was almost impossible to ultimately uncover and ultimately prosecute cartel conduct. That wasn't unique to South Africa. I think Colette's spoken about the approach which is going on internationally. There's been a lot of civic body, there's a lot of policy think tanks talking about all of these issues. That effectively was a hallmark of what was happening 20 years ago in relation to trying to unseat corrupt, excuse me, cartel activity. What happened? I think there was a recognition that there had to be a buy-in from business's perspective in order to effectively tackle cartel conduct. The cases are clear. Um, one of the which was probably a significant one involving U.S. enterprise in South Africa, and that was the Botash case. It became very apparent that it was almost impossible to unseat that, given the deep pockets of obviously the respondent's legal team, but also the difficulty from an agency perspective in tackling what was very critically difficult work and something which in the skill set of the authorities didn't exist. Fast forward, the introduction of the corporate leniency policy. As Michael mentioned, 
we were involved in relation to the formulation of that. But importantly, and I think as my colleague going to talk about a little later on, it was a government-led initiative implemented under the auspices of the competition agencies and specifically designed to encourage business as an ally in supporting tackling cartel conduct. And that can't be emphasized enough. I think we've talked and waxed lyrical today, and I think there's far better speakers than me who are going into the depths of this. But without the support of business, it's going to be an impossible feat to try and uncover significant malfeasance, which has existed for a number of years. There are certain hallmarks. Uh, obviously, we sought to try and ensure that there was adherence to international best practice, but they're effectively three Cs. There's clarity, commitment, credibility, a confidentiality regime, cooperation, and the necessary context. All of those are vital to ensure that there's a workable corporate leniency policy. Now, Michael's mentioned that I was instrumental in one of the biggest cases in, re in relation to the utilization of the corporate leniency policy. And we didn't just choose it because it's very close by, probably a stone's throw away where it all originated in Salt River, but that's the bread cartel matter. And I can't talk highly enough about it. Obviously, my personal involvement is, is clear. But why it was important is it demonstrated the efficacy, firstly, of the leniency po policy, excuse me, but it also demonstrated the ability of business to become an ally in relation to the prosecution of fellow cartelists. Now, it's probably going to be pointed out a bit later today, without that, that case would not exist. Without that, we wouldn't have class action litigation in the form of civil redress for, um, for uh, indigent consumers. And also, we wouldn't have a workable framework to uncover, obviously, cartel conduct, but also to prosecute cartel conduct successfully. That was purely a result of a single leniency application, which was filed in 2007. <clears throat> we were behind that. It took a lot. It took a lot of convincing to do. And it took a lot to try and demonstrate that trusting that agency was, and I'm talking obviously from a business perspective, sufficient enough to get the reward ultimately. That was a major step. And it was a step which I think is probably well documented in various other pieces and papers. But it set the landscape and it obviously changed the ability for cartel conduct to be uncovered, prosecuted, and ultimately gave civil redress to litigants, as I say. Now, I think from an agency perspective, it was uncharted territory. Obviously, these were implemented from an international best practice perspective. But engaging with business and effectively welcoming business into the arms of the state apparatus was a difficult step. It worked. It worked principally because there was significant buy-in from the corporation involved. And I think Colette's talked about the necessity for adequate compliance, the necessity for adequate involvement. Those are all hallmarks in relation to that case. <clears throat> now, without that, I don't think that there would have been the avalanche of evidence which existed sufficient enough to be able to prosecute the other parties involved. And that's important as well, because there was inside working knowledge of a cartel which enabled not just significant administrative penalties, it led to the resignation of CEOs involved in the respondent parties. It also enabled civic organizations to become involved. There was a significant public hearing with the Black Sash involved, Casatu involved, all which became features of our competition processes subsequently. But that enabled the voice of others, not just obviously business, to be present during the ultimate determination of the penalties involved in that case. It also involved close on six months of gathering evidence from a business's perspective, which is in, not insignificant, but again goes to demonstrate the amount of work which goes in, obviously not just to the leniency application, but the interaction between the agency and the leniency applicant. Now, it's a significant case. It set, as I say, not just the parameters of the leniency process, but most importantly, and I think for the discussion today, it ultimately proved to business that there was a working policy. And without that, I don't think business would have bought into the process subsequently. Business has bought into that process. And I think as a result of the, the case, but also what was found to be some of the criti criticisms towards the leniency process, there were a, a significant betterment in relation to that process as well as a result of input from international participants, but also from ourselves as representatives of the private bar. The leniency policy was improved. That was input not just obviously from international uh, individuals or corporations, but as I say, individuals in South Africa who were working through that. That resulted in a better policy. It resulted in a significant uptick. I don't know if the slides are working from my side, but I'll just try them quickly. 
um, and I, I can talk to them. But it resulted in a significant uptick in the amount of immunity applications. More importantly, it resulted in a significant uptick in the amount of penalties that were ultimately administered by the agency. One of the key issues that is being sought to be addressed from fighting corrupt activities is trying to uncover, obviously not just the conduct, but also to recover that, mo that money which has been taken, for example, overseas or which has been distributed to, uh, to other people's pockets rather than into the public purse. Again, I think without the leniency policy, and without a workable, uh, I suppose, an element of trust between business and the agency concerned, none of this would have been achieved. Without, obviously, a working framework, none of this would have been achieved. And without the buy of business, none of this would have been achieved. Premier was important, that's a bread cartel case, because it also gave the public insight into the process. That was by way of a, a robust settlement agreement. I think we've been talking about those, as Colette's mentioned, as from, from a, I suppose, an exposure perspective. But that gave the inner workings of not just the malfeasance, but it also gave the inner workings into the agency's operations, the manner in which those who were responsible were held accountable, and also gave opportunities to work out how there was some sort of restorative justice in the form of penalties, and how those were calculated. Now, some of the parties who sought to oppose that matter were penalized heavily. Record fines were imposed by the agencies, but also there were obligations on those parties to fulfill certain, certain other mandates, one of which was the creation of a supplier development fund, the first of its kind. That subsequently came out in other merger decisions in relation to Walmart. But again, it points out to the necessity not only of a working policy, a tried and tested working policy, buy-in from business, publicity, but I think some form of accountability in relation to those who were involved in the process, which has set the tone, I think, for a great blueprint, which we hope can be implemented in relation to what's going to be discussed today. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I mean, a couple of interesting things about, I suppose, the, the bread cartel. I mean, the, the, the one is, I mean, even advising clients now, not you know, unrelated to the matter, is that compliance with competition laws is a topic at corporate executive uh, discussions, uh, agendas um, all the time. It's not, it's not dismissed to sort of a compliance compliance sort of function. Um, and I think that is what, what the, the efficacy of the CLP has done. It's elevated um, the importance of compliance uh, quite drastically. But perhaps, John, you can give a little bit of input into this regard in terms of how it all unraveled, because there seems to be some similarity between what Colette mentioned uh, in Malaysia, uh, in the sense of how, w once you got everyone involved, how much evidence you had and wrongdoing you were able to sort of uncover and sort of unravel um, what w was ultimately sort of the tip of the iceberg. And it seemed like the same thing happened before Zonda. Uh, the, the scope of commission seemed pretty narrow in the beginning. And as people came forward and disclosed information, we just uncovered far more than, than, we, than we suspected. And it seems like something very similar happened in, in, in that case. Absolutely. I think what was the hallmark, if, if I like, in relation to the, the bread cartel was the authority was aware of only a very limited amount of conduct. Now, as a result of the approach from the leniency applicant, that conduct spread not just to what's close by to UCT, which was conduct in relation to the Western Cape, but it also resulted in conduct nationally in, in, relation, excuse me, in relation to about five other product areas. That was overwhelming. I think the agency would never have had that ability to uncover that conduct. As I said earlier on in the introduction, as I think Colette said, and has been discussed ad nauseum, cartels are secretive. It's almost impossible to understand what the inner workings are. Equally, corrupt activity is difficult to uncover. It's almost impossible from an agency perspective to get to know the inner workings of what's taken place. More often not that it's secretive, more often than not it's happened a couple of years ago, more often than not the protagonists aren't even in the country, and that necessitates the inner workings being divulged. Now, the form of leniency which I've discussed and which has subsequently been made into the corporate leniency policy, which it is today, enables that to come forward by way of a proper divulgence of that information. That's important because not only is it important to be able to divulge the necessary information, but the inner workings from a from a cartelist perspective are relevant for purposes obviously of, of whether or not leniency will be granted. Thanks for that, John. 
Hermione, as I mentioned earlier, you were very much as a cold face, uh, both in your role from the, from the NPA, um, but also at a time when foreign bribery, when corporate involvement was very much in the spotlight, you had to deal with it. Uh, you had to deal with it from a local perspective, you had to deal with it in the context of international cooperation. Um, <clears throat> give, you, you've heard Kalesi set a great, great sort of foundation. John's given some perspectives from sort of a, a practitioner's and a business perspective. Um, we'd love to hear your insights and, and you can really jump in from whichever angle you want to jump in first, uh, whether it's the current state of play or whether it's from what you'd like to see or whether it's from what you think the immediate next steps should be in order to advance this. We know, you, you, as I mentioned, you're a strong proponent of NTRs, but it would be great to get your insights into uh, the state of play. Thanks. I feel like I should sit on my legs so I can look like a grown-up. Um, um, thanks for having me on the panel. Um, and now that you've got me talking, good luck um, shutting me up. Um, <laughs> Um, so, um, I was not a proponent of NTR. In fact, I was as opposite of a proponent as you can find. Um, that's because I grew up in asset forfeiture. And, um, and I was actually going to tell the story about um, asset forfeiture in South Africa. But uh, I think John's story of, of how corporate leniency and the work of the Competition Commission in this area, it's the same story. Um, it's got the same ingredients um, for how to make something work. Um, the asset forfeiture, asset forfeiture in South Africa, when I started doing asset forfeiture, um, was as much of a swear word as NTR is in some court. Um, nobody saw any value in it. They, they, mostly my colleagues... Um, at the bar and in the legal profession and even on the bench felt that um, what is this um, not what non-conviction based asset recovery you can take the proceeds of crime from someone without convicting them that was heresy um, but but what the asset forfeiture um, regime had was um, a good legal framework um, it had a good proponent advocate um, in Willie Hoffmeyer, who was the head of the asset forfeiture unit, um, who developed a strategy to implement it, um, and uh, uh, quite a visionary strategy, um, so visionary that I get to go around the world now and tell other people about it and, and help them implement asset recovery strategies in those countries. Um, but it was... It was about creating capacity, um, at the same time testing legislation cautiously uh, in some instances, but also robustly. Um, it was a strategy about getting members of the bar in to argue the first cases, because no matter how um, talented I thought I was, a judge would probably listen more to them, train Grove than to me. Uh, he had all of those um, ingredients um, and, and after 10 years, we could boast a very impressive uh, body of jurisprudence um, that established asset uh, recovery as an important law enforcement tool. Um, it's now 20 years, uh, 20 odd years, and I think we've stalled a bit. In fact, I think we've stalled a lot. Um, and um, so we need to go back to seeing um, how we can reinvigorate um, that aspect. But the, the asset forfeiture story um, is relevant to this discussion because as someone involved in asset recovery and, and having to be labeled a heretic for advocating um, asset recovery, the one thing I was adamant um, about is that what we are not doing is letting people off the hook um, free of charge. That was our main criticism. And, and so when people talked about settlements and, and non-trial resolution, the idea that you could sort of acknowledge that you did something wrong, kind of pay back, but not suffer any stigma of, of a, a, a conviction, or, um, or at least in, in civil asset recovery, even though it's non-conviction based, there was at least judicial oversight um, that, that um, would approve or disapprove an asset forfeiture case. Uh, 
I should just say that one of the big criticisms that we eventually faced is although South Africa has conviction-based and non-conviction-based asset recovery, we ended up developing the jurisprudence of non-conviction-based far, far more than we did conviction-based. And why was that? Because there weren't many convictions happening, <laughs> even then. <laughs> um, so, so I think that brings me to why a non-trial resolution policy is so controversial. It, it is this idea that cor corporates, when they fear exposure and the risks of, of uh, reputational damage that comes with being associated with corruption, as companies like McKinsey and others can tell you, is devastating, right? So they are very interested in a set of rules that um, help them navigate how to uh, get out of jail, quite literally, um, uh, in a predictable and, and, and um, sort of certain manner. So, but just because business is deeply interested and invested doesn't mean the rest of us uh, shouldn't be. And what, what persuaded me that non-trial resolution is something that we as South Africans ought seriously to dis, um, discuss. And, and I have to say straight off, when people talk about non-trial resolution, I think many of us mean very many different things. So for me, the devil is in the detail. Um, but the problem is we're not debating the details. You know, what? who should be on this panel is law enforcement and the NPA, and they should be discussing their thinking on this topic, and we should be interrogating it. Parliament should be having committee hearings on this issue and debating it nonstop. Um, so none of it is, is settled. Um, it should become settled in that public um, debating process, because out of that process will come more or less the right um, approach for us. But, but I had the privilege, as, as you were saying, in the last three years, it's now four years, so um, the three years that I was in office, of, of having um, ringside seats, watching different jurisdictions approach um, uh, corporate accountability. Um, and, and the thing that I observed is that, that there, there was only really one player in this market, and that's the US DOJ. Um, corporations came knocking at my door, wanting to self-disclose. Um, why? Because I, they thought I was so powerful and so efficient and so effective that they had better rush and come and uh, disclose so that they can get, no. It was because they were already in trouble with the US DOJ. They were fearing um, the consequences that they knew would come from the US DOJ. Because the one thing you got from the US DOJ is certainty. The US DOJ has a list of policy guidelines um, for non-trial resolution that is transparent. So all the corporate lawyers all over the world know them off by heart because they know that they will need to advise their clients on what the outcome will be if they go down this um, non uh, this disclosure route, uh, the self-disclosure route. They also know, far more importantly, what the consequences will be if they don't. And so therein lies our problem in South Africa. Right? We, we do have some of, of as, as Colette was saying, we do have some features of non-trial resolution. We can decline to prosecute a corporation. Um, we, we struggle to, to characterize them as two or four witnesses because the section talks about individuals and, and it's very awkward to, to force um, corporate persons into that definition, just if you read the definition. So we could really tweak that and say, if a corporation came and said, okay, we've discovered uh, corruption in the business, um, we'd like to um, almost uh, plead guilty. But it wasn't us, it was the individual and the company. So preferably 
you prosecute the individual and we get the 204 status um, and, you know, we can pay back whatever benefits the company derived from the commission of those offenses. That, that kind of, so if we tweak 204, that will help, right? That's the first step in the process that has to be fixed. Um, the second step is, um, what are the rules of the game, right? Um, you know, it, it's a similar discussion with the whistleblower um, conversation. Um, people can become whistleblowers when they realize that somebody else has already blown the whistle on them. And if they don't get in there very quickly, they're going to be left out in the cold. So you have to be able to, um, and the US have a very good, um, they have rules around when in the process corporations disclose. So if a co corporation only discloses after there'd already been some exposure of the corruption or law enforcement is already investigating, they get fewer points than if they are the initiator of exposing um, or initiating the expo expose of the corruption. So the, the problem we have is we also have plea and sentence agreements. We can, we can strike a deal with the corporation if they plead guilty um, and pay a fine. Um, what we can't do is strike a deal with a corporation and say, well, we know you're guilty. Um, we're not going to obviously convict you, but we are going to um, take a settlement from you. We're going to get you to give evidence, um, give us all the information you have, uh, pay a lot of money, um, but, um, and then you can still go on doing business with governments because you won't be blacklisted because you won't have a conviction against your name. Um, that, that we, yeah, so we can uh, do plea and sentence agreements. But the problem with plea and sentence agreements is, um, is my favorite little example. Um, in, in the VBS case, I, I saw that um, one of the accountants pleaded guilty I think tendered evidence um, and got a, a reduced sentence, which he's about to have um, completed serving and he's about to come out of jail. The other accused have not yet been asked to plead. He must be feeling very silly, you know, having agreed to plead guilty when everybody else is still out there living large and having no consequences. So I don't think we must fool ourselves that if we have a system of non-trial resolution, that's the silver bullet, because we're still going to have to get the basics right. Um, and the basics is, if you, <laughs> those who come forward and come clean will get a benefit um, from doing so. But those who don't must be assured that they're going to suffer even harsher punishments Otherwise, it makes no sense, which brings us back to the basics, right? We need, we need the skills that we don't have. Um, no matter what the NPA says, we do not have the skills to do this kind of work. If anything drove me to a resignation, it is the fact that I received these reports from a number of corporates they will drown you in information. Um, they have hired law firms like these ones to self-disclose. So they go and download the entire organization's database of information. They, one co corporation said, we had 13 reviewers go through the emails that we had to check for purposes of this investigation. 13 reviewers, uh, 300 reviewers, sorry. When I, when I think I had about 30 people in the whole organization. <laughs> so it, it doesn't add up, you know. If, so that's why I think the example um, of, of uh, the competition uh, tribunal uh, uh, and the leniency policy, if it's not backed up with a, a capacitated um, institutional capacity, like in the US, when the US DOJ comes to town, everyone pays attention. You know, they don't, um, 
uh, it's just remarkable to sit around the table um, with, with prosecution authorities from around the world and the US DOJ. So for all the, the uh, frustration with their arrogance in this arena, they deserve it because um, you, you have an equality of arms. You have around the table corporate lawyers, well-resourced, well-heeled, but on this side, you don't have shrinking violets. You have serious capacity, and the people on the other side of the table know that. And until you have that, these policies um, are not really going to, to come to life. Um, I can say much, much more. Um, let me just check my notes and then I'll... Um, but I think we should uh, probably... <coughs> hand over yeah I, I think john you, you had a comment that you want to do yeah absolutely i think what, one of the aspects which i wanted to pick up in relation to that is obviously our lenity pro policy has been a huge success but that's no longer the case and if you look up on the slides there you can see um the, the kind of history of penalties that were imposed the vast majority occurred after the implementation of the 2008 policy. Now, that's obviously what I've mentioned earlier on, had the input of business, had the input of civic organizations, had the input of obviously international bar associations, et cetera. But equally, it had the support of business. And that was the, the critical point that I wanted to point out. Obviously, it elevated the success of the leniency policy in the business community, and people were prepared to come forward because there was a standard quid pro quo that Hermione's just mentioned as well. There was obviously, if you give me information, we'll preclude implementation of an administrative penalty. What happened after that, and I think this is a salutary lesson, certainly one for the implementation of an NTR regime, is that doubt was cast. Now, that didn't necessarily come in the form of legislation, but why the success of the leniency policy is clear is that what we've just discussed is it's consistent, it's clear, it's in a policy like it was in the US or is in the US, lawyers know what to do, they can advise clients. And obviously you can imagine from a business perspective, which is where I'm talking, is you've got to put forward individuals who are going to have to attest to the evidence. They're going to have to go through potentially a trial. They're going to have to go through public humiliation to a large extent, being the stocks with tomatoes thrown at them. And all of that was fundamental to, I think, the efficacy, as I say, of the leniency process. A couple of years ago, what happened in relation to our competition laws, it was amended to introduce criminal liability for cartel conduct. That in itself wasn't the problem, but where the problem really came in is that the efficacy of the policy was diluted and was diluted in the manner that the decision of whether or not to prosecute an individual who was now conceivably criminally liable didn't rest with the competition authorities. It effectively went to the NPA. And if the NPA did not decide that they weren't going to prosecute that individual, they're effectively at the mercy of the state and we're going to the criminal justice system. That's a hugely onerous burden to come forward and apply for immunity on behalf of a corporation if you know your executives are conceivably on the line for criminal liability in due course. But what does it do? You can see there's doubt. Once that doubt is created, businesses are not prepared to come forward and to divulge information if there's no certainty in relation to the process. As mentioned by Colette, a lot of the conduct that we deal with is not limited to South Africa. The vast majority originates internationally. You can imagine it's even more particular in that regard where an individual sitting in, for example, Germany conceivably has to come forward and give evidence in South Africa and there's no certainty in relation to the process because the individual might very well end up being criminally prosecuted for conduct which occurred internationally. All of those are very critical factors. Now, the, the main point, I think, from my perspective is the following. You have a very workable policy, which has a buy-in and support of business, all the hallmarks of what an effective policy should look like based on international best practice. But a single stroke of the pen effectively dilutes the efficacy of that. And that is because there's no clarity in relation ongoing from a policy perspective and there's disconnect between the prosecuting agency and the competition commission. And the ramifications are clear. We haven't had the significant penalties imposed over the last couple of years. Equally, leniency applications have dropped off dramatically. And I think it's a very, very important point for purposes of the discussion today for people to bear in mind, because if you start creating doubt in relation to a policy, it's not going to be utilizable. <clears throat> Thanks, John. I think very, very astute points. Um, I think the, the mic's going to be circulated 
to anyone who wants to comment on this. I'm going to read out a question that we've received so far, which is, as I understand the question, really, you know, would, I think essentially the TRC uh, have been a form of a non-trial resolution in order to exonerate all the, the financial crimes and economic crimes that were perpetrated during the apartheid and pre-apartheid governments? And I think the, the, the kicker to the question is really this, um, whether, whether that's formally or informally the case, would an NTR type regime be an appropriate mechanism to try and resolve uh, all the wrongdoing that's been uncovered uh, as part of the Zondo Commission? Um, would, would there be a, and I think that's the, the, the heart of the question, uh, would there be a way in which to uh, incentivize those implicated in Zondo to come rush forward, give full disclosure, et cetera, et cetera? Um, can we short circuit the process and uh, I think arrive at a quasi TRC type outcome? I don't know which one of you want to take that question, but I mean, you have, you have a view. You mean amnesty? Yeah. Um, no. Um, a a non-trial resolution is not the same as amnesty. Um, and and it, you can have amnesty if you have um, if you have mechanisms for for how to deal with the disclosures that you do receive. So if you know what the appropriate, um, or you have a, a shopping list of, of things you can do to, with those that do come forward. But again, most importantly, the ones who don't come forward must then experience the full wrath of the law. And if that's missing, then it's going to fail. So, so I, don't, I don't think amnesty is the way to go. Um, this is, is not amnesty. This is corporations come and make full disclosure. Now, of course, um, they, they are heavily incentivized to cut loose someone lower down the food chain um, and you know, explain to you how the top management had no idea about these terrible things that were happening in the name of the company and that benefited the company so fantastically they didn't know. You need to have people who can review those disclosures and look at the credibility of what they're saying and investigate. So there is no way around building capacity. And so I just um, want to use the platform that I have to say that, you know, we do have to rethink the prosecution altogether. And this is not a South African problem. I just did a talk uh, last year on, on what's happening around Europe. Europe is not doing much better than South Africa in holding corporations to account. The OECD bribery convention, um, the record of, of successful prosecutions for corporations who, whose officials go and bribe um, foreign officials. So the, the convention is the bribery of what foreign corrupt um, pra practices. So, I, you know, I, I studied four judgments um, out of Italy, out of Norway, out of Sweden. Um, so I'm missing. Um, but all four of them um, found bizarre ways to let companies off the hook. I, I, I sit on a, what, uh, um, the no, no, Norwegian anti-corruption prosecutors sort of support group. Uh, Billy Down is in that support group but he's by no means the only person facing prosecution from people he took on. Our, our colleague in Italy is being prosecuted by Shell, uh, not by Shell and Eni, but um, for trying to prosecute Shell and Eni. So this is, uh, I wrote down the word um, uh, Coletti's, conventional modes of justice. I don't know what that is anymore, but what I do know is they don't work. They haven't been working for a while, right? So that's why we have things like asset forfeiture, right? Um, we, and so the problem that, that non-trial resolution is trying to address is the recognition that we are never going to hold corporations to account for the role they play in our societies um, unless we try something different because... I, I challenge anyone to list the names of corporations around the world who have faced prosecution, and you will only come up with people that the US DOJ have done non-trial resolution settlements with. You will, I challenge you to show me a corporation involved in act crimes that have been prosecuted 
for doing so and, and appropriate sentences have been, been meted out. It doesn't happen. So this is the next best thing. Thank you. But not amnesty. Professor Ferris. Thank you. So I'm not quite sure how to put this, raise this issue, but um, do we have the same standard for public sector corruption and corporate malfeasance? Um, maybe there are different expectations because I think any kind of immunity from prosecution um, for politicians, those implicated in the Zondo Commission, for instance, will be controversial in the public space. Um, <clears throat> but if, as the evidence suggests that you guys have collected, um, efficacy suggests that some kind of immunity is helpful when you're dealing with um, endemic corruption, um, complex crimes, when you don't have the equality of arms and so forth. Because, you know, the politicians who are corrupt also, I think, have ways, have power. So do the corporations that, that are involved in corruption. So, so that's the sort of first uh, a problem. I personally don't, uh, I've been thinking about this not in a coherent way for a long time, if, if it provides a way of, of dealing with a sort of stickedness, stuckedness, I don't know what, how to put it, of the political corruption, which has just become more and more entrenched um, as and our ability to prosecute and, and get results uh, seems uh, completely degraded. Uh, so on efficacy, efficacy grounds, not excluding some kind of immunity. I don't really understand, Herman, the, 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 the difference between non-trial resolution and amnesty, because the amnesty, as I understand it, is conditional upon full disclosure. And maybe Paul has a view on this. Un, under our constitution, because of our strong rule of law jurisprudence, um, any kind of immunity from prosecution raises a rule of law, a constitutional problem, potentially. But I have to say that given where we are, even though there are costs, uh, this is uh, amnesties or non-trial resolutions aren't optimal, it's, it sticks in the gut, really. Um, if, if there are strong, is there strong evidence that uh, um, it improves enforcement, then it's, I think, uh, that it can't be taken off the table, needs possibly careful consideration. Just a question at the back there as well. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to build up on the issue raised, the timing and public consciousness and education. Because this matter is so novel. I remember Professor Matonzela raising the matter. It caused quite a storm. Why? on the eve of Zondo Commission report, when everybody's crying out for the blood of uh, the hounds who were eating public funds, then you come up with this escape route. That's how it was perceived. Which therefore means some kind of a public awareness, statistics, which show the comparative analysis of how this has worked elsewhere. But again, when I was seeing the comparison between the resolution for the individuals and those who are the corporates, 
in a South African climate, you have those who are politically exposed, who have been involved in corruption, saying that this is only looking at the public sector and the politicians, but not the corporate sector. And you know in South Africa there is a correlationship because the majority of your corporate might end up being, you know, color-coded in a sense Then it is racialized. How do we deal with that? Because you know that those who have stolen, they have said, no, 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 this is white monopoly capital and so forth because they want to say this is a corporate, uh, you know, problem. At the same time, the public expects accountability and consequence for those who are involved. Thanks. Okay. So what I'm hearing from um, delegates is that this system can look like amnesty, and that raises a reaction for South Africans for very good reasons. Um, so I want to without getting too technical and like like lawyers tend to do and split hairs, I just want to um, remind us that we started out with the, the concept of public-private cooperation in the UN Convention Against Corruption. Now, amnesty is a type of public-private cooperation. It's one subspecies. Non-trial resolutions are another type of public-private cooperation. So they are separate types, but they belong under the same heading. Now, amnesty for corruption has been tried in certain countries um, like Angola, Tunisia, um, Mongolia, Algeria, um, Nigeria, Moldova, I think. Um, they, those countries have given amnesties for corruption um, and then um, there's, there's some data available about that system, and then there's the data about this other subspecies of non-trial resolutions, some of which I presented today. Um, and there are some important differences between the two systems, which I'd like us to just be mindful of and not conflate them into the same concept. Um, non-trial resolutions, firstly and most importantly, are designed to address the problem that we have in South Africa, but also globally, um, and which um, is documented in my, my master's thesis, and the, the, the results I mean, of the research are publicly available, that the National Prosecuting Authority is effective in tackling low-level corruption in the public and the private sectors, but it's not effective in tackling high-level corruption in both the private and the public sectors. Now, this system of non-trial resolutions is specifically designed to address the problem of the lack of accountability for high-level corruption because it provides incentives for the company, which is a, a legal fiction, it's a legal entity, it can't go to jail, to hand over evidence which is used, as in the Malaysian case, in the prosecution of the chairman of the company responsible and the prime minister. So it's about incentivizing low-level implicated people to hand over evidence used in high-level prosecutions to address that problem. Another key difference is that it addresses, um, amnesty is just a case of, it's, it's more like a blanket, the amnesty that was proposed for South Africa was a blanket amnesty for crimes, corruption crimes of the past. But non-trial resolutions are case-by-case -case basis based on the the, the cooperation and the behavior of each company or natural person implicated. Um, so it's not something that would be available to everyone. It's available only to companies that are um, capable of reform, okay, that show that they're willing to make amends to society and they're capable of reform, and it incentivizes the implementation by those companies of effective self-policing of corruption risk in that company, by the company, at the company's expense, and detection of corruption. 
So it's a much more um, suitable system for um, not only what happened in the past, but as research shows, prevention of future corruption is more effective than punishing past corruption. And it's a system that takes that into account and incorporates that. Thank you, Colette. Can I just, uh, yeah. Um, so I would just add to that, that as I said, it's, it's not a shortcut. It's, it's um, not a substitute for the hard work. In fact, it, it, it makes for harder work. When a corporation comes to you and says, oh, we found some corruption, oops, sorry, um, but yeah, we'll make it good. Um, here's everything that we know about how this corruption went down. And, and so we've looked at your rules and we think we fit in these um, categories. So we should get a fine of say uh, a billion rand. Right, um, and and that's the extent to which the U.S. system is. You can literally slot in your information and come out with a figure, that is the figure that your corporation is going to be liable. This is only for corporations because you can't send corporations to jail, right? So if all that corporations are going to do is pay a lot of money, that's all you can get from a corporation. What it mustn't be confused with is what happens to the warm bodies that did the dirty deal. The company executive, the public official, the politician, law enforcement, whoever was involved, the warm bodies still have to be prosecuted. And if you don't have that, um, you, will, you will have what the US um, uh, has at the moment, that, that the American public is not very happy even though the, the amounts of US dollars that corporations are paying back, they are needing to see more live bodies in custody, more senior executives. So, you know, the, the policy will be discredited if they, they line up as they have been saying, we can pay so much. Um, and then the Glencore example, you know, you, Glencore agrees to pay a fine to the US DOJ and then the results come out the next day and it's like a, a drop in the, in the ocean, the, even though the fine looks fantastic to the rest of us um, relative to the benefits that they derive from the corruption. Um, and, and so it's not about anyone getting out of jail free. You can't send corporations to jail. So you can only fine them. Um, by and large, when you end up prosecuting a corporation, lots of employees lose their jobs, you know, so there are other considerations in how you want to deal with holding corporations accountable that are not uh, applicable to human beings. But it, it should not, if the human beings are shown to have been the ones who did the corruption and the bribing, they must be prosecuted and, and they can get a lenient sentence, but they still have to be um, held accountable. Uh, Kuga, I'm, I'm going to throw, uh, Nicola can give the mic to you. I'm, I'm going to throw one question to you guys, to both you and, and Colette, which is, and I think this is the, one of the, the essence of the, the questions, which is, are we considering NTRs only really being available for to deal with complex foreign uh, bribery and corruption? That, that's, that's sort of the essence of the OECD recommendations. And or are we sort of looking at it saying, well, even domestic companies, local companies, irrespective of how complex you as a company think your, your involvement in a crime was, once you have a policy, it's open for both local and international and individuals to come forward and, and disclose. Um, the, the, a policy like that would seem to address any notional concerns of a policy favoring international players or whatever political um, cons you know, concerns would be, it would seem to be quite a transparent um, objective. Is that how you see it play out as well? Both of you can chime in. Um, um, individuals already have this option. An individual can come and knock on our door and the, and the doors of the law enforcement and the NPA and say, uh, oops, I, I, I did the wrong thing. I deeply regret. Here's the full story of my involvement. Please don't prosecute me. Um, and I will, I will come clean. You, you give that person immunity from prosecution. Um, but the prerequisite is come forward, 
tell the full story under oath, honestly. Um, and if you do so, the court will, will indemnify you from prosecution. You want corporations to be able to do the same in respect of, of individual. And, and many of the self-disclosures consist of emails between the, the guilty parties. They use the corporate credit card to pay a lot of uh, the whining and dining of the bribes for law enforcement to get hold of that information, especially when the server sits in Switzerland, is unbelievably tedious and difficult. If you have a disclosure regime, those things are made easier. But, but we haven't used our Section 204 effectively. Uh, Colette was saying that we do manage to prosecute um, low-level corruption. I was gonna say name three, but, but um, I think that that we have so many problems in our in our criminal justice system. Um, we don't have the basics right, and so this is higher grade stuff, right? We, we need to go back to the basics, which is skilling up the, uh, our prosecutors, which is having policies. I think we need far more elaborate policies just for um, two or four uh, indemnities. The last time there was a two or four. Um, that caused uh, much public debate was in the Jackie Celebi trial where uh, Glenn Agliotti got 204 status and everyone was outraged. He ought to have been prosecuted after his failure to give honest testimony. He wasn't. So there the system falls down. If you don't back up the threats you make and then execute those threats when, when people don't comply, the whole system doesn't work. So someone can come and self-disclose, but if you find that they didn't disclose the key part that implicates the higher-ups in the company, you must be able to say, I'm very sorry, but we are going to prosecute. Forget all that. Um, all the discussions we are having, you haven't made full and honest disclosure, so the company goes on trial. And then actually be able to run that trial, which... I don't see many corporations fearing, but they do fear that the US DOJ will prosecute them. So that is still why they come and self-disclose here yeah, because they can use that as a, another sort of um, mitigating factor um, that they gave everything to South Africa and it's not their fault that they haven't prosecuted anyone. They did try. To add to what Hermian has said, um, it was a finding of my master's thesis that South Africa should consider non-trial resolutions for natural persons as well as legal persons. Um, I would look to a country like Malaysia. How did they use negotiated settlements? I know that Joe Lowe, the mastermind, um, our equivalent of, of one of the Guptas, approached the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission and offered to pay back hundreds of millions of dollars if they would give him a negotiated settlement and they turned him down. So they were not used in that case for the high level um, implicated persons. They were used for the low level implicated persons such as lawyers and accountants um, who had evidence to hand over that was valuable. So I think um, that is an interesting case study. Um, I think that in general, we can say that these instruments are suitable for certain types of offenders and certainly not for the masterminds and for the most guilty offenders. And at this, I just think I'd like to add that research shows that often people, the lower level offenders, are drawn into corruption not because of their own choice. They are tricked. They are... They are um, they, they are forced. They are coerced. And I, I think... For those kind of offenders, we can't have this moral judgment like you've done something wrong. We need to provide ways for those people to get out of the traps that they find themselves in. I've spoken to a retired professor who almost signed a corrupt contract, not knowing that, it, that he would find himself involved in corruption. Even someone with that level of education couldn't see the corruption in the contract before him. So it's, it's very easy for people to sign something and then they're implicated in a corrupt syndicate and it could happen to anyone. So I think we need to be careful about how we approach corruption and, and not just condemn it as a moral failing for everyone and give people like that opportunities to come forward and to disclose safely. And I think that the way that, you know, the Section 204 route 
it could be developed. Um, I do think that what Hermian said earlier about clear guidelines being available to the public would help a lot, as well as as well as protection for those who come forward. Thank you, Kate. Kugan. Thanks a lot, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to raise the point. Uh, this is a very interesting discussion. And Lord Peter Hain is coming in the next panel. And the, he's had very two different uh, courses of action with regard to Bain International. He led the attack and the South African government followed later on. And he has a different course of action with Hogan Lovells, also UK-based. And I think uh, it would be nice for the panel to bring that into the discussion later to, to, to get his uh, idea on why two different courses of action. I think Justice Golson is leading that. The other point is, uh, Hermion, you mentioned the warm bodies. Equally important is the cold bodies of the whistleblowers. And that needs to be top of everything. We, we focus on the perpetrators and the enablers, but we focus equally on the whistleblowers and the human rights defenders. Thanks. Thank you, Kugan. I mean, I mean, I think there's no doubt that a, a robust whistleblowing regime must go hand in hand with any effective NTR regime. Um, I think it's one of the hallmarks and I think the OECD uh, recommendations elevate that as well. Um, I think simply because there has been a panel on whistleblowing, we haven't focused on that element of it, but I, but I think that goes without saying um, it's, it's a critical feature of it. There's another question over there. Um, what emerges from this, this seems like a very valuable tool, NTRs, but <clears throat> it's a carrot. And when you have the carrot, it's more effective to have a stick as well. And the difficulty in our country seems to be the stick is, <clears throat> excuse me, broken or it's been, it's still growing and so on and so on. Now, earlier in the discussion today, Ian Farlam mentioned one obvious uh, solution, at least partial solution, is the use of members, members of the private bar to um, act in prosecutions. And I'm sure there are many members of the bar who'd be prepared to devote months of their lives at a reduced rate to a prosecution. But it goes even further. There are huge firms of attorneys in South Africa who could devote a team of five lawyers to doing in, uh, evidence investigation, evidence collection, um, drafting work, and it's not unprecedented. I, I hear, I, I, I do um, emphasize this is um, hearsay, that there's a recent prosecution, pending prosecution, I think it's against a couple of ESCOM officials, very high up, and the investigation work there was done by a private firm largely, and they produced a very, very formidable looking 100 or 200 page chart sheet, which turned a couple of faces pale. Now, why are we not doing, shouldn't this be a process which we should be using more and more? It can be funded directly by the state or it, or it could be funded by uh, some fund into which some of these millions or billions of uh, rands or dollars which are recovered from these big multinationals can go into, it could fund that. And this can happen whilst the MPA develops capacity or it could, it could be a permanent feature. I feel that we need to look more uh, with greater imagination at these solutions and not just look at it in this binary way. It's the NPA or nothing. Any comments? Thank you. Yeah, th thank you for that. I'll have one comment on the first, first element of this, which is, and I think John's alluded to this, is one of the benefits of the NTR is once you get that corporate to actually commit to full cooperation with the agency, you get exactly the capacity that Herman was speaking about earlier. You get that corporate, you get the, his that, or that firm's legal teams, their forensic auditors, you, you get all of that because they know that if they're failing to comply, their immunity is at risk. Um, so in many respects, and I think this is what happened with the Competition Commission, John can speak to that, is once you got just over that hurdle where you actually secured full cooperation by the corporate, a lot of it flowed from there because you had all that capacity building it assisted the agencies to do a successful prosecution and it's sort of this mutually reinforcing type of dynamic. So I think in, in that respect, it's probably one of the, the benefits of the NTRs. As to how the private sector can, can assist the NPA more directly, perhaps I'll leave that one to you, for you, Hermian. And since I'm no longer in the NPA, I can say whatever I like. Um, <laughs> Of course, um, of course we have skills in this country that can contribute to solving this problem. But I, at the risk of, 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 yeah, it's not that simple. And I'm sure you know that, but, but 
there is a big difference between prosecuting in the public interest and prosecuting in the interest of an individual client, right? And if you are used to, as members of the, the private bar are, um, in, in trying to solve a problem in an individual case, you know, it's, it's much more important for you to act under supervision. And our courts have, have said that about Section 38 prosecutions. It's the perfect mechanism. I spent my life in the NPA looking at that section and wondering why we're we not using that section just routinely. Um, and, you know, you can have rosters of people, you can have, but you need the policy framework. The NPA has not changed its policies in 10 years. I mean, they were obsolete at the time they were drafted. Imagine what they are now, right? They need to, you need, so the, the, the issue of, of um, two or four witnesses, it was hugely controversial, the Agliotti um, uh, issue. So then what did the NPA do? It just is so reluctant to use a section 204 I challenge anyone to tell me when they last heard of a case where a serious um, wit uh, witness was used who was actually a co-conspirator. We do it in murder cases and the odd, um, the odd um, racketeering prosecution that does get done. But in commercial crime and in corruption, they're, they're too terrified. And, and prosecutors are too terrified because there, there are no rules. They can, if they had rules, they can say, it's not me, it's the rule, right? I have to do what the rule says. Um, so <laughs> you need a legal re a, a policy regime to govern. And the courts have said this. The NPA must publish rules on how it's going to um, work with um, Section 38 prosecutors because you can have a, a an individual member of the bar and you say prosecute this case but i know that i have the importance of this case for me is what witnesses i want for this other case and so it's not the same as you're saying i'm going to get a conviction here at all costs and this is how i'm going to follow it so yes it should happen and it should have happened a long time ago that we improve I, I just refer you to the UK um, Crown Prosecution Service. If you go online, the rules are there for everybody to see. Everybody understands wherever there's a prosecutorial discretion to be exercised, what are the factors that are going to be taken into account? It's not, it's not sort of a mystery to everybody how the NPA makes decisions. It's understood and known. And that's, you know, when you talk about non-trial resolution for individuals, that just means that there should be clarity for individuals when you want to approach the police or the prosecution to give evidence that incriminates you. How's it going to work? You know, most people don't know um, because it's not something that anybody explains to you. So most people don't know these things exist. So the, the rulemaking policy formulation in the NPA is a big part of the problem. Um, if you solve that problem, you will get more effectiveness out of the people in the NPA and you will be able to bring people from outside in far more effectively. So it's, it's not one thing, or this thing or that. it's a package of things, you know, bringing, making the, the NPA an employer of choice, not an employer of last resort. Um, <laughs> when you can't get a job anywhere else, right, that's where you go. And, and by the way, they're not going to make you put you through a rigorous training program with great respect to the minister and the what, aspirant prosecutor program and, and the filling of vacancies. On their own, these things are not going to give us skilled prosecutors. We, we don't have trial lawyers in the NPA because people aren't going to trial. They are experts at postponements. But they're experts at postponements and 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 non-trial, not non um, plea and sentence agreements where you can plead guilty and pay a few rands without going to jail. That's what we have expertise in. But actual trials, leading witnesses having to decide which cooperate, which uh, which guilty person among all the guilty are we going to use? to testify against the others. 
that is that is the single most important thing that is going to break open um, these syndicates. And if prosecutors aren't clear about how they're going to go about getting that co cooperation, if if um, accused persons aren't clear about what's going to be in it for them and how they're going to be protected, um, you know, we, we're not going to move forward. So. All <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for that. We are we are over time. Uh, can, can you respond in thirty seconds? Yeah, I, I'm. Uh, I am conscious of the time, but I'm sure because it's such a short comfort break now, we're only going to take ten minutes. That we will start again at uh, at four o'clock. I do need to respond to Firoz's uh, constitutional question about NTRs. It's, it is true, uh, Section Nine of the Constitution talks about equality before the law, and is stealing shareholders' money different to stealing public money? Morally, certainly, but money is money. And uh, similarly, in relation to the uh, lack of policy in the NPA, the problem is that the NDPP is the person who makes the policy, and they're never there long enough to get round to doing it. On Lee's um, uh, question, we have tried to persuade the NPA to accept the services of senior counsel at the Cape Bar, and the, the, they're non-responsive, let's put it that way. All right, shall we take tea and be back at four shop, please? Thank you, everyone.